Good afternoon. I'm Tom Lenny. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, and I'm glad to see you out today. Uh, the McFarland Center sponsors and supports lectures, discussions, conferences, other special programs that encourage dialogue on questions of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. And with support from the Jesuit community uh, at the college, uh, each semester the McFarland Center hosts international visiting Jesuit fellows. Since 2000, this program has given more than 30 Jesuits from many different countries the time and the resources to pursue scholarship, to collaborate with American scholars, and to build a better sense of the Jesuit global community. While here, they live with our Holy Cross Jesuits, they participate in the life of the college, they teach, uh, they're involved in pastoral work, and uh, we invite our visiting Jesuits while they're here to introduce themselves by uh, giving a presentation about their area of expertise, which brings us together to this room today. This spring, we welcomed three international visiting Jesuit fellows, uh, the Father Ferenc Patch, who I think is teaching at the moment. Uh, he teaches at Gregorian University in Rome. He's a systematic theologian. Uh, Father Selva Rathenam, who we'll see today, is a professor at the Yanadipa uh, Vijapith, the JDV, as they call it, uh, uh, the Pontifical Athenaeum of Philosophy and Theology in Pune in India. Uh, Father Joachim Zundi, who is here with us too and will speak to us, is a native of Burkina Faso and a lecturer at Hakima University in Nairobi, Kenya. And then way in the back uh, with the hat on is our great uh, Father Tommy Nishant, who has been here already for a semester, so he's known to some of you. And he is teaching in the sociology department. Uh, he arrived last fall from Patna in Bihar in India. Today I'm happy to introduce Father Selva Rathanam for his lecture on Suffering, Resistance, and Freedom, a post-colonial subaltern Dalit study of Isaiah 52.13 to 53.12. A Hebrew Bible scholar, Father Rathanam became teaches scripture at the JDV in Pune. From 2014 to 2020, he served as the Institute's president. He was also vice president of the Catholic Faculties of India and teaches at various other theological institutes in India. He's written numerous articles in theological periodicals and presented scholarly papers at national and international conferences. In India, he leads national and international con he leads retreats combining Ignatian spirituality with the Indian biblical spirituality, and he is trained in Zen meditation, uh, vipassana, the uh, the Yangar branch of yoga sama, and in experiential psychotherapy. At Holy Cross is teaching a course on the Hebrew prophets. Please join me in welcoming Father Selva Rathanam. Thank you, Tom Landy, for um, introducing me. Good afternoon to all of you. So I'm very happy to present this uh, research paper to you. So the title of the paper is a post-colonial subaltern Dalit study of Isaiah, the last song of the suffering servant. Suffering, resistance, and freedom. So there are three things which I'm going to combine here. One is post-colonialism, that is the method which I have chosen. Then the second one is the context, that is what the subaltern context I have chosen the Dalit people from India as for my context. And the third one is the last song of the suffering servant. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 13 to Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12. First of all, what is post-colonialism? In 1981 to 83, I was doing my masters in English literature in India at that time, studying English literature in India means studying the British literature. Then gradually it extended at the most to American literature. Then from 1980 onwards, a new form of English literature entered into this study that was post-colonial literature. Post-colonial literature was the literature produced by the people from once colonized countries like India, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, 
సౌత్ అమెరికా ఆఫ్రికా వెస్ట్ ఇండీస్ దిస్ పోస్ట్ కలోనియల్ లిటరేచర్ హ్యాడ్ ద బ్యాక్ డ్రాప్ ఆఫ్ త్రీ థింగ్స్ సఫరింగ్ రెసిస్టెన్స్ అండ్ ఫ్రీడమ్ టు పుట్ ఇట్ టెక్నికలీ ఇట్ విల్ హ్యావ్ ద బ్యాక్ డ్రాప్ ఆఫ్ కలోనియలిజం when we were under the british rule there was suffering and resistance by the local people to this colonialism and freedom refers to the process of decolonization that's why in my title these three words are there the term post colonialism can be used either with hyphen or without hyphen with hyphen means post plus colonialism post means after for example india got its independence in 1947 august 15th so if we use the hyphen the meaning is after 1947 august 15th but that is not the meaning in which the post colonial scholars use post colonialism they use the word without hyphen why in 1947 only the colonized countries got their political freedom but political freedom is not the only effect of colonialism the effect of colonialism is economic political social religious and cultural therefore without hyphen post colonialism refers to the moment the colonial empire started its regime that is in the 18th century in india therefore the term post colonialism is the sum total of all the economic political social cultural changes brought about by the impact of colonialism for example economic the colonial countries came under the power of capitalism political that is the british empire social they were trying to bring about equality one aspect cultural say for example i am expressing myself in english that is the result of the colonial colonialism are these changes relevant only for the colonized societies therefore we can speak about post colonial india or not for the colonizing societies say for example post colonial britain actually a two way traffic of ideas goods and people so it is two way traffic between the colonized and the colonizing as the colonial countries felt the impact the british empire also felt the impact now what is colonialism first of all the word colonia is a latin word because at the beginning romans were the ones who built up a great empire and they had the colonial countries from colonia meaning farms or landed estates in the conquered territories in the conquered territories they had given the local land as gifts to the roman citizens who were there who occupied the country they are sites of hostility and violence felt at different levels coupled with the brutality of physical violence you might have heard about such violence in peru spain zimbabwe in israel for example very many times i had gone there and i go there often with my students what they call kibbutz kibbutz means settlements so very often this is the place of brutality of physical violence settlements away from the center that is rome or britain 
retaining their rights as roman citizens representing the interests of their mother country metropolis mater plus plus polis siphoning off the resources of the conquered territories so i'm going to show the world map of 1921 that the shaded areas represent the british colonial empire it's a kind of colonialism emerged since the 16th century that was driven primarily by the profit making motives of capitalism so if you see so this is what uh, britain very small country but all the shaded places are controlled by them this is what british empire so india pakistan bangladesh australia africa so nigeria canada so a great empire they had built up now let us move on to the next topic that is subaltern what do we mean by subaltern subaltern can have different meanings a junior a subordinate no i subjectivity of their own no identity all the suffering people can also be called in general subaltern those who are under the patriarchal society women poor gender people those who lack citizenship forced migrants refugees antonio gramsci called the subaltern unorganized mass of people subaltern people are those who did not have the voting power in the country disenfranchised people karl marx called them a mass of difference that is economically dispossessed people slaves laborers all the colonized can be called subaltern and then the people who are looked down upon that's why i have taken dalits one group of people from india all those under the hegemonic power of anyone or anything the proletariat those who are have nots ranajit guha a great scholar in india in 1982 he started the subaltern movement the entire population except the elite are called subaltern according to him gayatri spivak she is from india bengal but working in the united states and she is the one who is spearheading this topic subaltern according to her those who don't give orders but those who receive orders they are the subalterns the subaltern they are the oppressed people but at the same time the most oppressed people they are the subaltern the subaltern is the most oppressed experiencing oppression she is against that is uh, gayatri spivak the epistemic violence of the eurocentrism for them others the concept of the other has no self good but only they are self shadows she employs the strategy of post structuralism and deconstructivism in the post colonial literature to bring about the awareness and liberation from this systemic violence now let us move on to the dalit reality in india for the subaltern so there are so many wider meaning i had given i have chosen one part of it you can choose anything for your subaltern study i have chosen the dalit people who are the dalits the term dalit it came first from maharashtra one of the states in india where i am teaching pune or bombay they all belong to maharashtra in maharashtra there were two dalit leaders one was jyotira phule towards the end of the 19th century 
and he was the first one who gave this term dalit in fact the word dalit comes from sanskrit as well as from hebrew dal that is the word dal means broken people and this is the very same word which ambedkar after jyotira phule in maharashtra used this word for referring to the dalit people so this is the word which the dalit people had chosen for themselves this has got two sides of meaning one is broken crushed this is the meaning in which we see in amos the prophet chapter 2 verse 6 to 7 there are four words which he gives for referring to the poor like annavim tsadikim yevionim and one of the words which he gives is dal dalim dal means for amos landless laborers so broken another meaning is when things are broken something emerges from this brokenness so two meanings one is negative and the other one is positive see for example one christian writer in the 20th century mahabad ubadhyay he was a brahmin convert to christianity in india he used this particular word for jesus christ upon the cross with these two meanings jesus died on the cross he was crushed on the cross brutally murdered on the cross so that is what dal dalit crushed at the same time he rose from the dead the cross had become the symbol of victory therefore these two meanings fit very well jesus christ we are going to see how christians interpret this last song of the suffering servant in the context of jesus passion and resurrection in india the dalit people are known by different names harijans that means they are children of god avarnas that means they are outside varnas that means caste outside the caste system panchamas pancha means five they are outside the four castes main castes see brahmins kshatriyas vaishyas shudras there are four main castes in india dalits are outside these four categories that's why they are called fifth one panchamas chandalas the scum of the earth depressed class given by the british empire and then scheduled caste given by the independent india in the constitution the dalits are referred as scheduled caste there is a difference between caste and dalit both are not exactly the same so what is it that distinguishes the caste from the dalits the caste those people who are under the caste they do not experience what is called brokenness what i spoke to you about crushed but brokenness is the essential feature of the dalits that is because of the internalization of the brahmanic varna ideology caste ideology color ideology that is what varna just last month something happened in my state of tamil nadu when the government had given a separate uh, water tank for the dalit people the other caste people what did they do they went at night and mixed human feces excrements into that water tank because they cannot tolerate the dalit people drinking clean water Uma Sudhi joins us for the very latest on this. Uma, fortunately, there have been some arrests which have been made by the police. What details are you getting? 
Vishnu, arrests have not been made with regard to the human excrement that was found in huge quantities inside the drinking water, inside the tank meant exclusively for the scheduled caste community. But yes, arrests were made with regard to the two tumbler system that has followed in a tea shop as well as a woman who came to the temple and abused uh, the lower caste saying that, uh, or the so-called lower caste, she said, uh, saying that they should not be allowed inside the temple. But today, in fact, was a historic day, Vishnu, because the collector took the initiative of calling in Tamil Nadu Minister Mayapan also and along with traditional music playing they were welcomed formally into the temple premises and they conducted prayers along with the other two communities which are present in the same village and there is also a community cooking that happened of Pongal and there is a prasad that was distributed and everyone in the village was sharing it inside the temple, temple premises. Some of those people telling us that in my father's generation and grandfather's generation, we have not seen the inside of this temple and for the first time in our generation, we are getting to see how the deity inside the temple actually looks. And another woman saying that they should not stop Today, they should not top, uh, stop uh, with the incident just in this temple, but this is a question of rights for our community and that we want this to happen, not just to in our own uh, you know, temple and our own village in the time to come, but also in all temples across Tamil Nadu and wherever the scheduled castes are being deprived of these kind of rights. What I must point out is that this was a situation that could have really escalated because the excrements, human feces being found in drinking water meant for the scheduled caste community is not just an act of caste discrimination or caste horror, but actually a very criminal act that could have started an epidemic there. But the collector and the uh, you know, district authorities taking the initiative to try and diffuse the tension, uh, try to bring about a, uh, a, a kind of an initiative for communal amity and promoting that kind of feeling among everyone and also sending a very strong message that we are not going to tolerate any of this. But on the investigation about who exactly uh, was responsible for putting those uh, human excrements inside the drinking water, that investigation has not yet made any headway. Yeah. The villagers say they do not have any reason to suspect anyone, but the fact that this has happened just nine months after this tank was exclusively marked for them, that is something that uh, they certainly feel no, it's uh, just, it's extremely just hurt about and angry case. about. Uma, thanks very much for sharing those details. Absolutely horrific. So what is the nature of this untouchability? Why is it that one section of the people who are called Dalits are ill-treated by the others? This is not commensality or connubium. Commensality means eating together, mensa, table. Connubium, endogamy, marrying within the caste, one caste. That Commensality and connubium belongs to caste. But Dalit is not that. It is much more than that. I mean, untouchability is much more than that. It is not pollution of the primitive societies. Almost in every society, there is a purity pollution, which is temporary segregation in birth, growth, and death. But this segregation is purified through rites and rituals. But the untouchability experienced by the Dalit people is not merely temporary, but it is permanent. That's why untouchability which the Dalit people experience is hereditary, permanent, and communal. Thus subjected to ghetto from birth to death. Essential factors of untouchability. So this is the doctrine of pollution. To serve, they only can serve. They will never be served by others. To serve or not to be served by Brahmins, barbers, tailors, water carriers, etc. Not to use public conveniences like roads, wells, schools, temples. They cannot enter. And then occupation is a filthy occupation. If an untouchable touches a caste Hindu or his food or water, the accompanying uncleanness would impede his possibility of successful incarnation. That is the belief. Origin of untouchability. 
no satis uh, satisfactory answer given to this. But anyhow, two scholars have tried their best. One is B.R. Ambedkar, and the other one is Stanley Rice. B.R. Ambedkar gives two major reasons. One is contempt felt for the Buddhists. Because in ancient time in India, the villages were organized according to the tribals. When somebody commits a mistake in the tribal community, they will be thrown away. And these people who were thrown out of the tribal community are called broken men. And they were not accepted by any tribal community. Therefore, they were living in a ghetto outside the tribal communities. Gradually, the Buddhists accommodated them. Therefore, the Brahmins had segregated the Buddhists as well as the broken men. And these broken men became Dalits. And that became untouchability. Then the second reason could be beef eating. If you ask some Indian, they will ask, are you eating beef? Oh, I will not eat beef. Because the Brahmins have stopped eating beef. They also were eating at one time. Then gradually they have stopped. Then what happened to the Dalit people, these broken men who were living outside the tribal community? They were dying of hunger. Therefore, when the cow or ox died, and these people will go and bring the dead animal, and they will eat the flesh of it. Therefore, these people were considered to be untouchables. Now, Stanley Rice gives another two reasons. One is racial difference. According to him, first India was invaded by the Aryans. And then the Aryans have subjugated the local people, that is aboriginals. Gradually, the aboriginals became the Dalits and the Aryans became Brahmins who put them under caste categories. The second one is occupational theory. That is, they were doing all the dirty works. Therefore, they were considered to be untouchables. But both the scholars, they were trying to give some answers, but they are not satisfactory. General remarks. Race and caste. Both are... Um, we cannot say caste is the race because anthropometry makes it very clear there is no difference between one caste and the other or one caste and the Dalits. Actually, the word caste comes from Portuguese word casta from the 16th century, which means purity of blood. Even today, in very many parts of India, Dalit women are raped to subjugate, Dalit children are bonded to child labor, Dalit men are ordained into menial jobs and landlessness. Then religious sanctions through Sanskrit texts, which is called Varnashrama Dharma. And they have put them under these four categories of caste, which we have seen, Brahmana, Kshatriyas, Shudras, Vaishyas. And then the Vedas, which is the scripture, religious scriptures of the Hindus, that also gives this distinction, hierarchical distinction, in a poem called Purusha Shukta. Brahmins were born from the head of Brahma, God, but the Shudras were born from the feet of God. Then in Ramayana, Rama, he's the hero, and he goes and kills a person called Shumbuk because Though he was a Dalit, he was meditating, which they are not supposed to do. Then in Mahabharata, Arjuna is the hero. Arjuna was taught by his teacher Dronacharya in archery. But there was one Dalit called Ekalavya. He learnt it well. But this Dronacharya wanted his thumb to dedicate to him so that he will not fight against the Kshatriya Arjuna. In Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna, for example, he goes to the battlefield. There he has to fight against his own brothers, Kauravas. 
when he was hesitating krishna god advised him it is your caste duty akshatriya to fight against injustice and then manusmriti that is the legal text of the hindus that tells the first three castes brahmana kshatriya and vaishyas they are twice born what about the shudras and the dalit sandal they have to serve the twice born people and then anti caste movements emerged against such kind of untouchability they are all uh, religious movements in karnataka for example lingayats in tamil nadu kashmir and all and maharashtra bhakti movements and then from the islam muslims sufi movements and then there is a religion called sikhism in punjab but gradually during the british colonialism they were suppressed because the british wanted to divide the people and rule therefore they have used the caste system then what about the dalit christians very many christians became very many dalits became christians in order to escape from this caste untouchability of course christianity in india is as old as christ himself even there is a story that christ has come to india but it cannot be proved but definitely there is a theory of thomas the first disciple coming to india and then francis xavier a jesuit he started converting the dalit people but there was another roberto de nobili another jesuit who came from italy he converted only the high caste people because he thought when the high caste people get converted then all the other people will follow the suit then in 1950 there was an order from the indian president saying all the privileges of the indian government only the hindu christians only the hindu dalits can receive not the christians not the dalits who became christians then gradually sikhism was introduced and then buddhism was introduced there but those dalits who became christians and the muslims cannot receive the government help then in 1978 there was anti conversion bill any person who gets converted from hinduism to another religion can be considered as induced therefore conversion becomes very difficult to there there is a dalit church in india but it is administered by the upper caste people there are three fold discrimination which the dalit christians experience in india number 1 from the hindu people number 2 from the christian caste people those who are not dalits and then thirdly the dalit christians cannot get the help of the indian government today there is a debate going on between two ideologies in india one is hindutva and the other one is dalit movements hindutva legitimizes hierarchical culture people are born high or low but the dalit culture advocates equality there are 200 million dalits in india who form 20% of the total indian population conversion to christianity has not redeemed 19 million dalit christians from social discrimination and untouchability but it has only added to their misery the church in india is a dalit church because 70% of india india's 25 million christians are dalits 70% are dalits the indian church but it is the higher caste people who form only 30% of church population who control the church by preempting the key positions the majority of the catholic bishops and clergy the religious and lay leaders come from the upper caste one can say that this 30% of the upper caste occupy the 
of the administration and leadership within the church. Thus the Dalits are pushed aside and reduced to insignificance. Let us come to the text from the prophet Isaiah. Prophet Isaiah has got 66 chapters. It is divided into three parts. First Isaiah, second Isaiah, third Isaiah. First Isaiah chapter 1 to 39, second Isaiah 40 to 55, and third Isaiah 56 to 66. From the second Isaiah, the location is the exilic situation. People were deported in 587 and they were there for 50 years. From there, the prophet Isaiah is writing. And there, we, there are four songs of the suffering servant. The last song of the suffering servant is, I have chosen. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 13 to Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12. Hinne yaske lavdi yarum ve nissa ve gavak mavod ka ashe shamamu aleka rabbim ken mishkat me yish mariyehu ve to arob mi bane adam ken yazze goyim rabbim alav ik patsu malakim pihem Ki asher lo sufar lakem ravu. Ve asher lo shamavu hit bonanu. He yamin lishmu atenu. Uz rova aduna yalmi niglata. Vaya alka yo nek lavanav. Ve kashoresh me yeret siya. Lo to ar lo velo hadar. Ve nir yehu velo marie. Ve nek madehu. Nivze ve hadal yishim. Yish makvorot. Viduva holi. Vuk master panim mimenu. Nivze valo hashavo hashav nuhu. Akain kolaye nuhu nasa. Vu makvove nu sabalam. Va anaknu. Hashav Nuhu Naguwa Mukke Elohim Wumma Wunne Behu Mekolal Mi Pesha Yenu Mi Dukka Me Avonotenu Musar Shalomenu Alav Wuva Havurato Nirfalanu Kulanu Katson Tayinu Yish Le Darko Paninu Vadunai Kibgiya Bo Yet Won Kulanu Nigas Beku Naane Velo Yiftak Peeb Kase Latevak Yuval Vuk Rahel Livne Gosezeha Neyalama Velo Yiftak Peeb May what say, woman Mishpat, Lukach? Ve yet doro, me asoteach. Ki nigzar, me eretz hayim. Mi pesha ammi. Negalamo. Ve yitten yet rashayim. Kivro. Ve yet ashir, be motav. Allo hamas asa. The low mirma be peeb. Badonai hapets daku. He holi. Yim tasim asham nafsho. Yirie zera ya arik yamim. Ve hefets adonai. Be yado itslach. Me amal nafsho. Yirie. Yisba. Bedato Yet Saddik Saddik Avdi La Rabbim Va Avunotam Ku is Bol Lakain Akalek Lo Varabim Ve Yet Atsumim Yakalek Shalal Tahatta Sher He Yara La Mavit Nafsho Ve Yet Poshim Nimna Veku hate Rabbim Nasa, 
de la Poshim Yafgiya. So we are going to take, um, I divide this um, last song into three parts according to the voice. The prologue and the epilogue, the beginning at the end. There it is Yahweh who speaks. There we see the triumphal language. Then the poem itself can be divided into two parts, verses 1 to 7 and then 8 to 10. Verse 1 to 7, very often we hear the second person, we, we, we. First they accuse the servant. God had abandoned you and then we do not want to look at you. You are a cursed person. Then gradually there is a change in them. Oh, he is cursed. He is abandoned. He is crushed. For our sake. Our sin he bore. So now, how do we interpret this? There are two ways to interpret. The first way is what the Christians have interpreted traditionally. They have applied this to Jesus Christ. The second way is applying the post-colonial method on the Dalit context, I interpret in a different way. To me, you have to accept the suffering as virtue in order to bring about redemption for others cannot be accepted. It is only the high caste people who oppress the others or the oppressing people can tell the oppressed accept the suffering. It is demeaning. Will the suffering people also say the same thing? No. Therefore you are going to see the new meaning which this method of post-colonialism brings to this text. Christians for example use three verbs. One is to carry, another one is to bear and the other one is to lay. Nasa to carry. Saval to bear, paga to lay. These three verbs occur twice, repeatedly. Say for example, nasa, carry. The word is used of the scapegoat, bearing Israel's sins into the wilderness on the day of atonement in the book of Leviticus. Nasa can also imply the taking away, forgiveness or pardon of sin, iniquity, and transgression. Then the second word is saval, bear. The stress is, so bearing the heavy load. The stress is on the process of bearing or transporting a load. Hence becomes a figure of servitude. In Isaiah 53, it puts the stress of bearing the weight of human sickness, sorrows, sin, and punishment. Therefore the Christians say, we wonder how heavy this load of sin felt when it settled it upon Jesus. Then the third verb is paga, to lay. In the Hephil stem, that is the uh, Hebrew grammar, there are two primary meanings both used in our text, to intercede and to lay, burden. So the servant to lamb in this passage, carries or bears the heavy load of sin, as would a sacrifice. But it is our sin, the sin of all of us, that is laid upon him. Under the Levitical system of sacrifice, sin was transferred from the sinner to the sacrifice by means of laying on of hands. The sin is understood to pass from the sinner to the sacrifice which then carries the sins. Since there is a reference to all these things in these verbs, Christians interpret in this way. But I want to apply post-colonial method. What is the meaning do I give to this poem? Post-colonial interpretation. Paying attention to the expressed and unexpressed voices is one of the ways in which post-colonial studies unravel the meaning of the text. The voice of God in the prologue and the epilogue, the voice of the anonymous we in the first part of the poem, 
the voice of someone in the latter part of the poem. I take three concepts from three scholars from the post-colonial literature. One is Edward Said, from him I take the concept of otherness. And the second one is Gayatri Spivak, from her I take the concept of subaltern disconstructivism. And then the third one is Hami Baba, from whom I take the concept of hybridity and mimicry. And I apply them to this poem. First of all, otherness. That is Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 to 6. At the beginning, this we, a group of people, accuse the servant. Then later they say their heart is changed. It is because of our sin, God had punished him. But first they thought God abandoned him and the human abandoned him. For Edward Said, the post-colonial theory is built around the concept of otherness, a Manichaean allegory of every reality into dichotomies of high or low. For example, in Luke chapter 18, verses 9, 14, Pharisee and the publican. Pharisee says, I, 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 five times. So he compares himself with the publican and belittles him. This is called binary opposition or otherness. Such conflict between the oppressor and the oppressed is seen in the first part of the poem. The British had the policy of divide and rule to control the subjects and made use of the caste system in India to their own advantage by playing one against the other. The conflicting situation in this poem underlies the division in the exilic community, perhaps successfully engineered by the Babylonian captors. Post-colonialism brings awareness to the divided groups, the divided they fall, and united they stand. The changed attitude of others towards the servant in the poem is a step in that direction. This can open the eyes of the divided communities in India to search for common grounds to relate and to grow. The second element which it implies the Edward Sayyid's theory is redemptive element. In the concept of otherness, there is falsification of identities on both the oppressor who elevate themselves to superhuman status and the oppressed who lower themselves to the subhuman status. Redemption for both would be to recognize what they are. Both are equal human beings. For this, both have to confront their past. The oppressed has to resist and the oppressor has to acknowledge his demonic elements and affirm the other. This is redemption for both. This is what happening in the servant song. Thus, it is not the innocent suffering, as the traditional Christians say, which brings about redemption. But what goes on in and between lives of both parties? Thus the post-colonial method exposes the falsity of the traditionally held truth and arrives at the new truth. Then the third implication. The vision and philosophy of the Brahmanic institution is that inequality is natural. But for the Dalits who are born and live unequal, Equality is philosophy. Historically, it is for this that the Dalits converted in large numbers to Buddhism, Sikhism, Islam and Christianity. In India, the Dalits are considered to receive neither blessing from God nor regard from caste people. They are isolated within the human community and assailed by blows. Their suffering and their lost honor were attributed to God's smiting and his wrath. Thus the Dalits are said to have lost their beauty as the servant in the song has lost his beauty. This loss is due to the rejection at two levels. One by God, which is called karma theory in India. In the past life you have committed sin. Therefore in this life you have born Dalits. 
Now accept the suffering. In the next life, you will be born as a liberated man. And another by the people. Village economy controlled by violent caste people. Gandhiji, for example, insisted on conversion of caste people's heart. Ambedkar insisted on organization, agitation. Post-colonial method takes both into account. Let us come to Spivak's deconstruction as a Bolton strategy and the silence of the servant. She asked a rhetorical question, can the subaltern speak? She wrote a short story. The story is this. This is what happened really in Bengal, in India. She is from Bengal, Calcutta. There was a woman, well-educated, very forward-looking woman. And she got married. Her husband died. She was still young. Now, according to the custom, when the husband is buried, the wife has to commit sati. She has to jump into the fire and die. But she cannot accept it. People are coming from, the relatives were coming from all parts of India. The next day morning, the burial is going to take place and the woman is supposed to commit sati. The next day, early in the morning, they went and knocked on the door of the woman. There was no response. They broke open the door and the woman committed suicide and she was hanging on the ceiling fan. Then the people interpreted this saying, she loved her husband so much that she could not wait till the morning. Therefore, she committed suicide. Then Spivak asked the question, is it a fact? She is a subaltern. In the patriarchal society, there was no one to listen to her. Speaking involves listening. I speak. If you do not listen, nobody will hear my speech. Therefore, it does not mean that she didn't want to say anything, but there was no listening. She is subaltern. Subaltern Derrida, for example, tells first person, second person, third person. I am speaking first person. You are listening second person. We speak about somebody, him, they, her, third person. When we accuse the third person, she or he does not um, have the chance to defend. That is what subaltern. Can the subaltern speak? I apply this to the servant song. Twice the phrase is repeated. He did not open his mouth. He was like a sheep moving towards the shearers. He kept silence. The traditional Christianity interpreted this saying Jesus accepted the suffering without opening his mouth. Thus this innocent suffering had brought about redemption for all of us. But is it true? I say this suffering servant is a subaltern. There was no one to listen to him. Therefore he was silent. That is the resistance. Why is the servant silent? In the past, the colonial mind portrayed the silence of the servant as a virtue, obedience to God without rebellion for a higher goal. He is silent because before God and human. To me, the servant is subaltern, whose voice could not be heard. We have not opened our ears, eyes, heart and hands because he is untouchable. This is the deconstructivist way of interpreting. He opened not his mouth is repeated for emphasis. He was oppressed and he was afflicted and he did not open his mouth. No sacrificial terminology is used here in connection with the servant. The servant suffered as a result of the sins of others. 
but not vicariously and the suffering may have an atoning power but not in a substitutionary way that is my contention the silence of the dalits in india is due to the rejection by the caste people through the imposition of low self image slavish menial work this rejection is so strong that they internalize it in a culture of silence the way out for them is to realize through the deconstructivist strategy that no one is born high or low on the caste minded people clearing the space to allow them to speak you need not represent to the subaltern but we must clear the space for them to express silence is not merely a sign of weakness but also a sign of resistance caste based brahmanic hinduism legitimized untouchability through scripture and made their silence vicarious and virtuous but would it have the same meaning from the servant's point of view finally baba's hybridity mimicry and the triumphal language in the prologue and the epilogue baba's contribution to the understanding of colonial culture is its hybridity its in betweenness of two cultures colonizing and colonized indian in blood and color but not indian in taste in france fanon's phrase black skin and white masks or naipaul's mimic men these are all post colonial literature mimicry repeats rather than represents hybridity subverts the narratives of colonial power and dominant cultures the servant song uses a triumphal language at the beginning and the end it can be understood either positively or negatively positively it is a celebration born out of freedom and the mutual mingling of different groups in this hybridity the ideal of a monolithic culture is demolished the servants welcoming many nations with sprinkling and the kings shutting their mouths in respect for the servant in the prologue show that although their identities and rules and roles are not changed their relationship is changed and has become more complex and hybrid triumphal language can perhaps be a catalyst for this awakening negatively it is mere mimicry or not a representation the only power which the oppressed are aware of is the power of the oppressor in their emancipation they can only repeat the voices from the center hence the roles are reversed the servant is portrayed as occupying the throne while the other seem to be at the receiving end it is a strategy from the underside to denigrate and to destroy the oppressive opposite in certain parts of india at certain times when dalits get organized and break their silence to claim their human dignity they are branded as aggressive and violent either in words or in deeds there is after all a mimicry of their tormentors the previous masters it does not represent the dalit culture reversal of power is not the ultimate goal of the dalit struggle the goal is to build up the common human community after living for 3000 years close to each other the caste and the dalit categories are not untouched by each other a hybrid cultural criss cross always takes place dalits in my state of tamil nadu were disparagingly called parayas parai is a tamil word meaning drum even today it is the dalits who beat the drums sing and dance for marriage and funerals simplicity and joy are their possessions which no oppression could take away from them the last one in hybridity such noble qualities can be nurtured in common human community in the willingness of the brahmin doctor to treat a dalit patient 
or in the willingness of a brahmin widow to go in for another marriage i see hybridity or perhaps dalitization in action in spite of the gory suffering of the servant in the body of the poem the framework hammers on the triumphal victory of the servant this is a technique to annihilate the opposite camp with a bloodless coup to defeat the enemy one cannot remain content with the narration of the history of sorrows the more the oppressed cries the more the oppressor beats if the dalit stop with critiquing the oppressive brahmanic system they only play into the game or the discourse set by the brahmanic system therefore keeping the focus on dalitization is important because thereby the dalits set the discourse for themselves rewriting dalit history will have to be informed with dalit pride thank you yeah as i mentioned here 30% of the uh, catholic ch um, uh, the church christianity is of the higher caste people and they are the well educated people the dalits did not get education and um, though here and there there is charity work is there but this charity work has not become work of social justice because the leaders the priests the bishops the nuns so 90% are uh, of the higher caste therefore the dalit people the dalit christians experience more than the dalit hindus three kinds of discriminations i spoke to you now there is uh, this awareness is there therefore gradually the charity now is moving towards social action justice work but it is a slow process definitely there is a strong um, uh, revolutionary movement among the dalits beginning from bhimrao uh, um, and also b r ambedkar in very many parts of india in fact um, uh, in one of the states uh, uttar pradesh that is the largest state in india at one time um, Uh, the dalits um, got the political power and um, therefore the movement is there but they form only the tw only 20% of the total population of india therefore even to get the political power is a difficulty they have to join with others but the movement the awareness is increasing and thanks to the christian missionaries and the christian churches which had educated the poorest of the poor who are the dalits therefore gradually the conscientization is emerging this is the unique contribution of christianity to the dalits in india that is why the ruling political party for example today the fundamentalist they are against conversion they want once the people become christians and then they will come away from this hierarchical caste structure but um, the fundamentalist uh, hindus they want to keep the hierarchy therefore conversion is averted so at a political level i see that but i guess i'm saying if you take that reconceptualization of the suffering servant song yeah you know where it's been used in sort of supersessionist ways about jesus and applying to jesus yeah if you turn it and reframe it to the dalit people yeah is that well received is there a puzzlement do you think people still read it through the old categories that you do that no no par in a parallel terms different interpretations are going on for example the very same paper i presented to the biblical group in canada um, in uh, halifax but uh, people uh, did not appreciate much because they are all so much emotionally taken up by jesus carrying our sins and uh, but when i present uh, such interpretation which is exegetically um, we are closer to uh, the text only we are changing the sentence in the text but um, uh, it is not much appreciated 
and um, but among the dalits this is very much appreciated yeah for example um, moses uh, why he was arguing so much and pleading with uh, uh, pharaoh to send the people uh, away pharaoh will never do it once he does it he loses his power same way people will never come down from their authority which they enjoy that is the problem jesus said truth will make you free but people are not ready for truth but for authority and power that is the problem there that is why in my poem interpretation i said two things are necessary one is change of hearts on the part of the higher caste and the awareness also on the part of uh, the dalits and these two only will bring about building up common human community thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.